interest in toroidal propellers seems to remain high. Many people have posted videos about their particular take on the design. All are different to some degree. Many are much like the one I presented a few videos ago, with a blade profile lofted or swept along the curve. For drones, they usually have two blades. The ones I've seen for drones have little or no offset between the leading and trailing root, like this. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Sharrow Boat Propeller. It uses three blades, a hub that is more like a shaft, and a root offset so large that you could mistake it for a helical propeller. As you can see, all of these are just a matter of changing a few parameters in the basic design. I have seen another approach that comes up with a related shape but is designed entirely differently with the blade shape driven by a loft. Let me show you one of those now. I'm going to do this design in the part workbench. I'll start with a sketch on the XY plane and we want to create an ellipse. The exact size doesn't matter yet, I'll adjust it later. When manipulating an ellipse in the sketcher, FreeCAD has an unfortunate habit of occasionally collapsing it down to a line, too close to even grab a point to re-expand it. To prevent that, I'll go ahead and set horizontal and vertical constraints on the size. For now, I'll just take the existing height using a constraint only to hold it in place. I'll set the length to 150 millimeters since I know that's what I'm going to want now. I'll just constrain any one of these construction points to be on the x-axis along with the ellipse origin to constrain the orientation. I think I'd like the height to be 100 millimeters, so I'll adjust the vertical distance constraint. One end of the ellipse should be 1 millimeter away from the origin, so I'll set that constraint. We're fully constrained, so I can close the sketch. To make this a little easier to visualize, I'll create the hub now. So, new sketch, drop in a circle fixed to the origin, and set the radius of 10 millimeters. Now select that sketch and extrude it to 10 millimeters high. Rename the extrusion to hub just to keep things clear. Now to form the inner diameter of the blade. I'll select the sketch, create a sub-object shape binder, and I'll set its offset to negative 1 millimeter. Now select the sketch again and clone it. Select the clone and change its placement angle to 15 degrees and set Z equals to 10 millimeters. I'll select the binder and clone it as well. Select the binder clone and using the formula editor I'll set its placement to match the sketch clone. Angle equal to sketch 2 dplacementrotationangle and z equal to sketch2d.placement.base.z. Be mindful of the less than and greater than signs here. Autocomplete will be your friend. Now create a loft from the sketch to the clone and make it a solid. This is the outer wall. Now another loft going from the binder to the clone of the binder, also a solid. This gives me two lofts, so now select Loft and Loft 001 and Boolean Cut. Go into the cut and into Loft 001 and hide away the binder and the clone of the binder so we can see the blade properly. Select the cut, which is the blade, and create a draft polar array. Set the number to 3, be sure to reset the center point to 0, and OK that. I think I'd like the blade to be just a little bit flatter, so I'll open up the array, the cut, and the loft, go to the clone of the sketch, and change the angle to 20. I think I'd also like it taller, so I'll change the Z from 10 millimeters to 20 millimeters. That, of course, means that I also need to increase the extrude distance on the hub to 20 millimeters to match. The hub looks a little bit small to me, so open up the hub and go into the sketch and change the radius to 20 millimeters. That looks a little bit more reasonable. 
Looking at this, we can see that there are points where the rings of the blade cross each other. I've seen some designs out there that just leave it exactly like that. I'm not sure if it causes any harm or not. Another approach is to make the hub larger to completely cover it over. Finally, I could always draw all three of the ellipses in the initial sketch and use the trim tool there to make everything meet up the way I like. That removes the option to easily change the blade count parametrically, but it's a simple enough design that it may not matter. For drones, most people prefer a two-bladed design. Let's have a look at that. First, I'll take the most obvious step and select the array. Change the number to 2. That's immediately looking a lot closer, but the blade span should be larger for a drone. I'll just go into the sketch for the blade and change the length of the ellipse to 200 millimeters. Close the sketch and I can see immediately that we have a geometry issue. What happened? We have the inner wall defined by the shape binder offset and we rotate both inner and outer ellipse in a circular motion as they rise to the Z offset. The offset makes them just out of step enough that the inner shape passes through the outer shape at the outermost edge of the blade. We can fix that easily enough by going into loft 001 and selecting the shape binder and upping the offset to negative 3 millimeters. There we go, we have a nice continuous surface again. Something I should mention here, there is a very specific reason that I did this in the form of an inner and an outer solid and then a boolean cut. Initially I intended to take the shape binder of the initial ellipse, fill the offset, clone the binder and just use those filled surfaces for my loft. For whatever reason, FreeCAD did not handle that very well and ended up filling in the middle of the blade. I would say that's at the very least an infelicity. Fortunately, I had this method as a workaround. Just a small reminder that as useful as FreeCAD is, it is a work in progress. Interestingly, in part design, my initial approach works just fine. The only caveat is that when I try to change the span of the blade, the part design loft fails somewhat mysteriously, while the part workbench setup just shows the geometry problem clearly. I'll get to that in a moment. For those of you who prefer the part design workbench, that's coming up next. So as expected, we start out in the part design workbench. Now create a body and create a sketch on the XY plane. Put in a circle at the origin and set its radius to 20 millimeters. Close the sketch and pad it to 20 millimeters. That's the hub done. Now for the blade, create another sketch. I want to also put this on the XY plane rather than on the hub in order to avoid any topological naming problems later. Sketches on the base plane without external references are always safe. Click View section so I can see what I'm doing, and now I'm going to add an ellipse again. Constrain the height to 100 millimeters, the width to 150 millimeters. Again, constrain a construction point to be on the x-axis to control the orientation. Slide it over and constrain the edge of the ellipse to be 1 millimeter from the origin. Looks good, so I'll close. Now select the sketch and create a sub-object shape binder. Select the binder and go into the data pane and set the offset of negative 1 millimeters. Also set the offset fill to be true. Now I need a draft clone of the binder. Select the shape binder, switch to the draft workbench, and use the draft clone. I need to use the draft clone because the part design clone will want to put the clone in a body of its own, which isn't going to work here. Return to the part design workbench, select the binder clone, and in the data pane, set the placement angle to 20 degrees and the placement Z to 20 millimeters. 
Now I'm going to zoom in, hide the sketch, and very carefully select the face of the binder. Now I'll click Loft. We can see Binder Face 1 is the object for the profile. Click Add Section and very carefully select the face of the Binder clone. Loft and Part Design always creates a solid, so just click OK. Now we zoom out a little and it looks good. Select the Additive Loft and click on Polar Pattern. Set the occurrences to 3 and there we have it. Now, to be complete, I'm going to change our design as the part workbench design was changed. I'll go into the polar pattern and set the number of instances to 2. Reopen the sketch for the blade and change its size to 250mm by 100mm. Close the sketch and the geometry is broken. This is what I was talking about earlier. The geometry is obviously broken, but it's a little bit difficult to tell why. I believe it's the same problem we had in the park workbench, that at this size it simply became too thin, and the inner face and the outer face crossed each other. Fortunately, the solution is the same as in the part workbench. I'll select the binder and increase the offset to negative 3, and all is well. So which one do you think is the real toroidal propeller? If any of them. Have you seen any other designs that could be considered toroidal propellers? Have you seen or done any comparative tests? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video or found it useful, please like, subscribe, and share. If there's anything you'd like to see covered here, please let me know in the comments below.